Okay, great. Welcome everyone. Nicholas is going to be talking about non-semisimple 3D TQFTs for the Fagan, Tippin, and Algebras and Quantum Groups. Feel free to start whenever you're ready. Great. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to get to talk in the Rocky Mountains. I love this place. Uh, Denver has a close uh, position in my heart. Um, but today I wanted to tell you about a story in physics that is um, highly informed by recent developments in representation theory. Um, I'm a physicist by training. Um, so hopefully I don't say too many ridiculous things. I'll try to keep things mostly mathematical, although my talk won't really be a lemma theorem definition sort of talk. Um, but the story I wanna tell you about is a sort of non-semi-simple generalization of a famous story known to many in um, the context of turn simon theory. Um, and it's all based on a recent archive preprint that came out on Monday um, with Thomas um, Tudor de Mofta and Nathan Gere. Um, and it's a very expansive paper. Um, and so I've taken a very, very small slice of what's in this paper, um, tried to tailor it more towards the representation theory audience, but we'll see how that goes. Um, okay, so the first thing I wanted to do is remind or introduce you to churn simons theory. Um, churn simons theory is a three-dimensional QFT. It depends on the choice of gauge group and uh, level. Today, I'm just gonna be talking about um, the special unitary groups and the level in that case is just an integer. More generally, it has interpretation in terms of, I'm oh, sorry, in terms of um, classifying spaces, but we don't need such sophistication here. Um, I've written down the action functional. If that means anything to you, you probably know what it is already. If you don't know what an action functional is, this is probably sort of meaningless, but the main point of um, what I wanted to say with this action functional is it's a theory based off of um, SUN gauge bundles over three-dimensional manifolds. That's what this 3D is. Um, and the main player is A, which is the one form inside of the connection on said gauge bundle. Um, the equations of motion say that it's flat um, and there's lots of cool things that can be said. Um, it's a topological theory, for example. Um, but for me, the most important thing are these set of observables called Wilson lines. Um, as I said, there's a gauge bundle around. Wilson lines are specified by a representation and a curve inside of your three manifold. And I take the trace in my representation of the holonomy of that curve. Um, this is sort of the main ingredient um, in Chern Simon's theory. Um, and we can look at correlation functions of these observables, which means I throw a bunch of them in my three A manifold. They're supported on disconnected. Um, circles, and these circles may link with one another. I've drawn a hop link here and a uh, trefoil as well. Um, each one of the links can, in principle, be colored by different representations. Um, and uh, of course, they're sort of disjoint circles, but they can be knotted with one another. Um, the resulting thing is invariant of the colored link and M. Uh, where M is the three manifold, it's colored by these representations. But if you restrict to the case of just SU2 and S3 as your manifold, pick all of your representations to be the fundamental representation, then you'll get the Jones polynomial at a specific root of unity determined by this level up here. Um, uh, this was sort of the famous story by Witten, and um, I hope to sort of illustrate bits and pieces of this as we go on. Um, but before then, I wanted to say a couple of words about some abstract nonsense. I know mathematicians love their abstract nonsense, so let's, let's start with that. Um, but this is the physics abstract nonsense. Um, so as I was saying here, the main ingredient was this so-called Wilson line operator. So I want to tell you some abstract nonsense about Wilson or line operators in general in 3D TQFTs. Um, so, Line operators in a 3D TQFT form a braided tensor category. Um, sometimes you get other adjectives 
but for the moment, I'm just going to be interested in the braiding and the tensor uh, structure on this on this category. Um, the objects of this category are uh, the line operators of our three-dimensional TQFT. Um, in Chern-Simons theory, they were the Wilson lines. So in effect, the objects are labeled by a representation. Um, the morphisms in this category between two of my line operators are ways to join two lines. Um, technically, these are called local operators that fit at these junctions, but you can just think of them as ways to go from line L to line L prime. In Chern Simons theory, you find that the uh, HOM spaces are either zero, the zero vector space, or a one dimensional vector space, depending on whether the R's are the same. Um, there's some subtleties with regard to which R's you should be using, but I'm going to sort of be blithe here and say that if R and R prime are the same, then it's one. Um, in reality, there's uh, some quotient of the set of dominant weights um, that sort of shrinks the infinite number of representations of SUN down to some finite subset. Um, but that's sort of too far down the physics trail. Um, anyways, uh, this is a category, so sh I should be able to combine morphisms. And that comes from colliding these junctions. If I have three line operators, L, L prime, and L prime prime, and two junctions that join them successively, I can slide those two junctions together to get a junction between the top and the very bottom. Um, and this way, I get to compose the morphisms O and O prime to get O times O prime, or O prime times O, depending on which way you do the composition. Nicholas, I have a question. Sorry, yeah, would you mind totally. reminding us what's the relation between R and L and R prime and L prime? Yeah, totally. So for each um, L, for every line operator in your theory, um, there's some data associated to it. In Chern Simon's theory, the data is sort of uniquely determined by the choice of a representation. Um, these Wilson lines only have as their data a curve, which is sort of um, ancillary. We're sort of looking only at like the local features and curves locally are all just lines. Um, but the sort of thing labeling the line operator in Jordan Simon's theory is this representation R. So um, if R and R prime are different, then the only O that can be here is zero. So it's kind of boring. And only when L equals L prime equals L prime prime, do you have a non-trivial set of junctions. Um, and the composition is one times one is one. Um, but in general, for more general TQFTs, you have very, very large set of data that can be used to define a line operator. Um, and this is sort of the general nonsense that goes on behind them. Any other questions? OK. Um, then the tensor structure and the braiding structure come from throwing lines at one another and twisting lines around one another. If you're familiar with the Reshetik and Tarayev sort of pictures, these are probably pretty familiar. Um, but the main point is that line operators in three dimensions have the structure of a braided tensor category. Um, sometimes you hear the words E2 tensor or E2 category, um, but uh, I won't go too far down that line. The main point is there's a braiding, there's a tensor product in this category. Okay. So now some more abstract nonsense. Um, one of the crucial tools in our later analysis is going to be the presence of a boundary condition. Um, in quantum field theories or classical mechanics, um, classical field theories, um, if your uh, space-time manifold has a boundary, you have to specify the behavior of your fields at the boundary. Um, and given such a boundary condition, we can represent our category of line operators. So I've used representation theory once so far. Um, what do I mean by this? If I have a boundary condition B, um, I can look at lines and how they end on the boundary. So for every line operator L, I can send it to a vector space of ways L can end on B. Um, it's a vector space because we can sort of 
add these boundary operators to one another. And this is actually a functor insofar as we can look at these junctions I was talking about before and throw the junction at the boundary to sort of create an action of the category of line operators on the boundary. Um, a better way to say this is actually as a functor into the category of modules for an algebra of local operators on the boundary. So you can imagine you have just some local operator here and you can throw it at that point. And that should define an action of the local operators on this boundary on these junctions of lines. And the fact that this is a functor into the module category is just a statement that you can either collide on the boundary first or you can collide from above first. And these two operations commute with one another. Um, so the action of C on the module should commute with the action of operators on the boundary on the module. So it's a module morphism. And ideally, this should be an equivalence of categories. Of course, you shouldn't expect it to be an equivalence with Vect because vector spaces, the morphisms between vector spaces are very large. Um, but if you restrict to module morphisms, then one can hope that it's actually going to be an equivalence of categories. And if your module category has some braiding structure to it, you can hope that the um, functor you get here is actually a braided tensor functor. And so this is going to be sort of the main physical gadgets we're going to use to understand Turn Simons theory and in turn our generalization thereof. Um, so that's sort of the end of the abstract nonsense. Are there any questions about that? Okay, great. So um, now let's talk about how churn simons theory can be solved. Um, what I mean by that is being able to calculate all of these um, three manifold invariants I was talking about before. We have some three manifold, we can hope to take it apart into bits and pieces and glue them together in some meaningful way to get the answer from simpler computations. And the first step in doing that um, was uh, ingeniously come up with by, uh, by Witten. So if we start with our 3D TQFT, um, which is just SUN Turn Simons theory at level K uh, minus N, which is positive in this context, um, we're going to play the same game I talked about before. We're going to throw in a boundary condition. And instead of thinking about these Wilson lines in a physical context, we'll translate them into a more algebraic context. In particular, there's a boundary condition whose algebra of boundary operators, this ops B I was talking about earlier, is exactly a affine algebra, a really uh, simple quotient of an affine algebra based on SLN for this case. SLN here is because it's the complexification of Lie algebra of SUN. Um, so in doing this translation, um, Witten realized that computations in terms of Wilson lines in this three-dimensional Chern Simons theory can entirely be reformulated in terms of vertex operator algebras and computations in this boundary WZW model. Okay. Um, but vertex operator algebras are hard. Um, I'm sure I don't need to tell you guys that. Um, and so it's nice to translate this into actual algebras instead of vertex operator algebras. And this can be done using the famous kasdan lustig correspondence, which relates modules for this simple quotient to modules for the quantum group at um, an even root of unity. Um, and we can complete this triangle uh, with everyone's favorite Reshetik and Turayev construction, which then turns this category of modules for the quantum group into a 3D TQFT. And this whole diagram sort of commutes with one another. Um, the central gadget in all of this is, believe it or not, a category. Um, the category of line operators from the perspective of Chern-Simons theory, the category of modules for the 
simple quotient of the affine VOA and a quotient of the category of quantum group modules. The quotient of the quantum group modules comes out because of uh, modules with vanishing quantum dimensions. And to really get something out of it, you have to simply simplify that category uh, that's humongously reduced now. Um, and in the end, you get this nice uh, set of identifications where you have this one central semi-simple braided tensor category or really modular tensor category um, that has three different um, descriptions in terms of VOAs, in terms of quantum groups, and in terms of this 3D TQFT. Um, okay, but what about the rest? I said that this Reshetikin to Rive construction uses a very, very, very small part of the quantum group. It's um, a natural question to ask, what about the rest of it? So this semi-simplified category might just be um, a feature or maybe it's a bug, but can we extend that triangle above to the full category of modules for the quantum group or some at least non semi simple category of modules for the quantum group. Um, and I should say that the quantum group I'm using here is the simply connected Cassidy Concini group. Um, it has inside of it the restricted quantum group. Um, and there's lots of quantum groups around, but this is the Cassidy Concini one. Um, I'm sure there's lots to be said there, but I don't have as much time as would be necessary. But anyways, um, we can sort of already start with one part of it. Um, if we look at the quantum group and all of its modules, um, there's uh, the conjectural slash somewhat proven uh, logarithmic version of a Kajdenlisch dig correspondence, which relates the um, unrestricted quantum group to um, the module category or modules for the unrestricted quantum group to the module category of the Fagan T. Poonin algebra. Um, it was conjectured originally by Fagan, Kayutinov, Simikatov, and Tipunin. Um, as a braided tensor category statement, it was proven by two different groups uh, Thomas and some of his friends, and Terry Gannon and Negron um, for n equals two, k equals two. Um, that's the k or p equals two triplet model. Um, as a linear category, um, it was sort of proved by McRae and Yang, um, but Nagatomo and Suchia also deserve some statements there. And again, there's a humongous story back here that I'm not necessarily doing justice to, um, but I wanted to point out that there is, at the very least, some relation between quantum groups and vertex operator algebras that includes a non-semi-simple version of the previous statement. Um, okay. There's also been a lot of work in constructing a 3D TQFT based off of the uh, category of quantum group modules. And again, there's a humongous story back uh, behind this, but um, what one finds out is there's a natural construction that one can do with this category of modules that's very subtle and very technical at its heart um, by Constantino Gear and Petro Morand. Um, and their construction subsumes many earlier works of uh, invariance of three manifolds based on quantum groups. Um, including Hennings, Lukashenko, the ADO invariant, uh, Kashaev invariants, um, and uses a lot of technical tools on uh, the theory of 3D CQFTs built from tensor categories. Um, and the list is very long. I'm not going to be able to do it justice, but here's just like a sampling. So we've got sort of two sides of the triangle, um, and our job or at least what we attacked in our uh, recent paper is fleshing out the rest of this. Namely, um, we wanna come up with a 3D TQFT in physics as a physicist might uh, define it. 
in terms of like Lagrangians and things like that, um, as opposed to this abstract construction in terms of quantum group modules. Um, so that we have this holomorphic boundary condition side of things. And so that's exactly what our paper does. It tries to find such a theory. Um, and it turns out to be a topological twist of a 3D n equals four theory. Um, again, there's lots of physics behind that statement. Um, and I don't want to say a whole lot of it because it's, a, again, a very, very deep, deep road. But in any case, um, at the center of all of this is some now non-semi-simple, presumably braided tensor category um, that generalizes the previous uh, turn simon story. Namely, we have some identifications of line operators in a 3D TQFT, modules for a quantum group, and modules for a VOA. Of course, this is going to be a non-semi-simple category of modules for each of those things. And uh, that's sort of like the crucial heart of why this isn't so very easy. Um, one sort of humongous disclaimer that I'm unfortunately writing really small is that the 3D TQFT constructions are um, uh, from this CGP style. Uh, doesn't really do everything that physics instructs us is necessary. Namely, when you do these topological twists, um, you're necessary, you're sort of required to live in the uh, category of chain complexes and do everything in a derived fashion. Whereas this CGP invariant really just captures the homological degree zero portion of some presumably fully derived uh, set of computations. And you shouldn't be so afraid of these things because, well, if you have non-semi-simple categories, um, you really should be keeping uh, track of higher extensions. And so derived things are there whether you like it or not. Um, okay. Um, cool. So what? I told you that now we have this physics. Um, what, what do we do with this physics? Well, um, the first sort of, or perhaps zero thing one can say is that some questions are easy for physics. Um, that's probably not so satisfying for someone who isn't so physically inclined. So that's why I put it as a zero. Um, but there is some things that could be said that have been done in terms of just regular vanilla turn Simons, namely, um, there's a space of states in this Chern Simons theory that's related to conformal blocks of the VOA and a Rashatikin Turayev style uh, state space built from uh, the category of quantum group modules. And the graded character or Euler character of this state space is computed by a partition function in Chern Simons theory. And um, these can be computed through many techniques, but one of which includes using supersymmetry or a supersymmetric version of Chern Simons theory. Um, okay, again, that's not so satisfying because if you don't know about supersymmetry and localization and all that stuff, then that's sort of a meaningless statement. So let's say something less useless, um, namely that this um, QFT allows us to reformulate questions in algebra in terms of questions in geometry and vice versa. Again, this probably isn't so interesting for representation theorists because I didn't necessarily say representation theory, but algebras and geometry are near and dear to representation theorists. So hopefully that's meaningful. Um, and in Chern Simons theory, an example of this same phenomenon um, playing on the previous one is that the space of conformal blocks slash Rashutik and Turai of state space can be realized as a space of um, sections of a bundle over bungee on the surface. Um, so we have conformal blocks and this Rashutik and Turayev space, which are naturally sort of algebraic in nature. You built them from Homs between modules um, or intertwiners or what have you. On the right-hand side, you have something that's almost entirely algebraic. You have some line bundle, you're looking at sections of this line bundle. Um, 
but nonetheless, they're related to one another. Um, and then uh, sort of second point, which is the one I sort of want to stress in the remainder of my talk is that um, this physical construction allows or perhaps sometimes suggests uh, equivalences between the algebras we've seen before and presumably different algebras. Um, in the context of SUN Chern Simons theory, this leads to the well known level rank duality, namely, um, if you look at Chern Simons theory, um, it's got two sort of canonically defined boundary conditions that I'll call Neumann and Dirichlet. Dirichlet is the one that I talked about earlier that leads to a, um, uh, a, a boundary West Amino Witten model, this SLN uh, current algebra. Um, on the Dirichlet, sorry, on the Neumann side, you have a similar thing that ends up looking like a coset of some fermions. And um, what you end up finding is that given these two boundary conditions, you can represent the category of line operators with either one of them. But the category of line operators is sort of the God given thing. And it's gonna be a way to translate between category of modules for this um, West Amina Witten model and the category of modules for this coset. And so you can learn something about the category of modules for these VOAs through the physics of Chern Simons theory, um, simply saying that these should be equivalent ways of describing my category of line operators in the bulk of TQFT. Um, there's some uh, braid reversals that go on here. Um, there's lots of interesting things to be said about um, level rank U duality. So, so let's do that. Um, I guess um, before I before I do that, are there any questions? Um, one thing I should say is that each one of these um, points can be asked in our three D uh, TQFT with um, Tudor, Nathan, and Thomas. Um, this is just sort of the already established statements one might recognize in terms of Turn simons theory um, and uh, more familiar objects like bungee and um, level rank duality. Okay, um, then let me remind you about just vanilla level rank duality. Um, it comes about as follows. Um, we start by considering a collection of complex fermions. We have n times k of them. Um, I've thrown some indices on here, but you don't have to worry about it so much. Um, if you know what complex fermions are, then you're good to go. Um, they're just a VOA with two types of odd generators. They're got the usual one over z OPE. Um, there's a set of currents inside of here um, that looks like a trace of a uh, normal ordered product. I haven't drawn the normal ordering, sorry. Um, but anyways, it generates an SLN current algebra, um, current subalgebra of the uh, complex fermions. And I'll call this DNK. This is the Dirichlet boundary condition I was talking about before in some sense. Okay. Um, it's commutant, which I'll call N tilde, um, is identified with a set of currents that generate a GLK um, current algebra with the level N. And moreover, the commutant of this N tilde is exactly D. So these two current algebras or current subalgebras are a mutually commuting pair inside of this humongous set of copies of uh, complex fermions. And the embedding in uh, this set of complex fermions induces a braid reversed equivalence between the categories 
of modules for these two BOAs. Free fermions sort of have a trivial category of modules, it's just vector spaces. Um, and this uh, embedding and the decomposition of the complex fermions in terms of modules of D and N um, leads to this non-trivial equivalence of categories. Um, and in physics, this is sometimes stated as U type Chern Simons theory is the same as S type or SU type Chern Simons theory. Um, so if you read things about Chern Simons L rank duality, you might see statements sort of like this green thing at the bottom. <clears throat> okay. Um, so what I want to do next is tell you a bit about um, what our new level rank duality looks like. Um, and this one's gonna be a logarithmic version of level rank duality. We saw earlier that on one side, this D type boundary condition is gonna be a Fagan to Kunin type algebra. And on the other side, we're gonna get something that sort of looks like this N type uh, current algebra, or sorry, not current algebra, this N type, N -type uh, vertex operator algebra. It's not gonna be currents anymore, it'll be something much more subtle. Um, but anyways, it comes out of our QFT. Okay, so um, we're gonna play the same game as before. We're gonna have two types of boundary conditions. Um, the first boundary condition is gonna be a Dirichlet-like boundary condition. And it furnishes the fagan tipunin algebra for SL2. Uh, this one is fairly well known. Um, it results in the triplet algebras and um, the representation categories of these guys are fairly well studied. Um, one point that is sort of going to um, come up later is that this vertex operator algebra is a subalgebra of free fermions. And so this should be sort of something tickling the back of your mind. This sort of looks like regular level rank duality. And if you sort of pulled away a little bit and asked uh, the same question as before, maybe I can look at the commutant and start playing the same games. Um, that'd be one way to approach the problem. You see that this sits in some sort of free fermions and you want to um, find its mutual commutant. Um, but there's a, another way you can arrive at the commutant uh, that's sort of inspired by this physics. But one point being is that you could sort of formally take this statement that the fagan tipunin algebra includes in some large collection of fermions and then start looking at commutants and proving identities with these commutants to deduce a level rank type duality. Um, the Neumann like boundary condition, just as before, is going to be a type of coset. Um, and sort of mm, some general notion or uh, some general thing one learns from physics is that when you have uh, Turn Simon's gauge fields in the bulk, which our 3D TQFT does, um, and they're given Neumann boundary conditions, you end up finding cosets of. Uh, of some algebra where the coset is with respect to the sort of gauge groups um, affine algebra. Here, our um, bulk TQFT is a churn simons gauging of another well-studied um, 3D quantum field theory. Um, I don't wanna say a whole lot about that just because it's a very, um, long story in physics, but the sort of salient features of that construction is that it 
i.e. the theory that we gauge with chern simons fields has a well-studied boundary vertex operator algebra. Um, the theory that shows up is this um, S-duality interface theory in super Yang Mills. Um, these are just words in physics, but what you end up finding is a very concrete um, vertex operator algebra on its boundary, namely this classical Langlands kernel um, in this context, just for SU2, and it's a affine algebra or a simple current or a simple quotient of an affine algebra. For higher rank and other groups, it's not going to be a current algebra. Um, SL2 is sort of a very sometimes too easy example, but this um, general A for a league algebra um, G is uh, a well-studied beast. Um, Thomas has some nice papers with Davide Gaioto studying these vertex operator algebras associated with um, S-duality interfaces. And this A is sort of the simplest instance of one of those gadgets. So anyways, um, what the 3D TQFT um, instructs you to do is to take this boundary algebra, this ASL2, um, or more generally ASLN, um, you have to add to it some additional um, degrees of freedom. In some sense, these fermions right here are akin to the fermions you coset um, in the regular level rank duality case. Um, inside of here, or well, inside of here, there's an SL2 current algebra, and there's another one in here, and their levels add up to be exactly k minus 2 or k minus n in general. Um, and when you take this coset, or sorry, when you perform this gauging, it's uh, just as before going to be a sort of coset type construction. Um, and so um, now what we can try to hope to do is play the same games as before. Um, we have this n boundary condition, we have this d boundary condition. Um, although I haven't shown it here and I don't know if, um, definitely didn't write down how I want to explain it. Um, but, um, at the very least, uh, I should, oh, I should have written something down for that. Um, I also I also claim that n maybe I'll just say it um, yeah um, maybe I'll do I want to say um, yeah let's just go for it um, okay <laughs> so um, we have this d we have this n. I mentioned how D should include inside of a collection of free fermions. Um, I feel ashamed for not writing down more about how N includes in them. But in any case, I claim, or at least our conjecture, is that there's an embedding of, well, I told you this, this half of it, um, of a slight modification of N uh, that I wrote just before as a coset of this ASL2. Um, claim is that we have embeddings or there exist embeddings of these two VOAs into a collection of free fermions, a large collection of free fermions, such that a couple things hold true. Um, first and foremost, they're mutual commutants inside this collection of free fermions, exactly in the same fashion as um, for the usual level rank duality case where we had two affine algebras included in this. Um, here we have a Fig and Tipunin algebra and some other strange coset of a bunch of fermions in this duality kernel. Okay, but there's more. Um, there should also be a braid reverse equivalence between the category of modules of these two things. Um, this minor modification of n to n tilde it seems to be a, 
or at least I don't understand it as well as I would like. Um, I'll explain a bit about how it shows up, but um, we expect that at the very least, the linear categories of modules for n and n tilde should be the same. And this question about uh, um, braiding um, and how the braiding should be passed through is sort of where this modification comes up. Um, I've been told that it's analogous to the uh, situation in um, level rank duality where you try to compare SLN at level M to SLM at level N um, and you have to perform orbifolds and extensions to actually make the statements correct. Um, I don't entirely know if that's the same situation as here. It seems plausible, but I also have some other inklings of what it might be, um, but we haven't nailed it down exactly. But in any case, for this n tilde, which is its commutant of this d, there should be a braid reversed equivalence um, between these uh, two VOAs. Um, but this is um, not it, but wait, there's more. Um, if we take free fermions and decompose it in terms of modules for these two algebras, there should be a very, very specific type of decomposition. Um, for one, the free fermions should be projective for both D and for N tilde. Uh, when we view free fermions as a module for D, it should be a projective module. Um, in terms of N tilde, it should also be a projective module. Um, and the decomposition of free fermions in terms of modules for these two uh, should have this very precise form. Um, first, um, we take a sum over simple objects for the Fagan T. Poonin algebra. Um, for each simple object, we take a tensor product of um, the projective cover of that simple and the image of the simple under this braid reverse equivalence with a dual. Um, similarly, if we decompose it in terms of n tilde, um, decompose it as a module for n tilde, um, it should have a similar form. Uh, tau will send uh, this projective to a projective. So this is a projective doodad. Um, but it should have a very similar decomposition in terms of a sum over simples um, for the Fig and T-Poonin algebras. Um, and of course, there's a generalization to higher rank um, and probably other uh, Lie algebras. Um, but I should mention that this uh, exact form of the decomposition um, is something that's sort of inspired by the requirement that there is a braid reversed equivalence. Um, namely, if we stick to the semi-simple setting, um, work of Thomas Kanade and I think, is it Andy Linshaw? Um, Sorry, I think you're muted. Um, and it says that um, if you have this sort of setup where you have some simple vertex operator algebra that extends the product of two vertex operator algebras in the same way as we have here where we have vertex operator algebra one, two, including in a simple thing. Um, and you have a decomposition of free fermion, or sorry, of this extension in terms of sums over simples, um, such that the two pieces are mutual commutants in this simple thing, um, then there should be this map where we send simples uh, by these composition factors to one another. And this mapping should induce a braid reversed equivalence. Um, and this is a, a if and only if sort of statement, namely in the semi-simple setting, one and three are known to be equivalent to two, um, so long as the thing that extends is uh, simple. Um, but the non-semi-simple uh, non version of the statement is not well understood from what I understand. 
Um, it should be Robert McRae. Oh, sorry. Can you say that again? Uh, Robert McRae. Uh, Mc McRae. Okay, great. Um, and he's proven that it's a no, general no, no, statement? It, no, no, no. It's Thomas, myself, and Robert. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I see what you're saying. My apologies. Um, great. Yeah. So in the semi-simple setting, it's um, the three of you. Um, in the non-semi-simple setting, I don't know if it's known, or at least I think it should be expected um, that it holds true. Um, OK, so we have this conjecture. Um, if um, we knew everything, everything about um, Fagan two point algebra is it should be a uh, relatively, I mean, it, it shouldn't be easy to do. Um, but what we were able to do in our paper is to um, look at branching ratios of these large set of free fermions and show that it has this type of decomposition um, that one would expect for this type of equivalence. Um, there's some subtleties in terms of um, nailing down which exact commutants one ends up finding. And that's sort of where the, um, the tilde comes in. When we do these branching ratio computations, we almost get an on the nose, um, but we end up finding that it's slightly extended from one another. So there seems to be some correction to the field theory analysis um, that should account for this n tilde um, as compared to n. And um, that's something I certainly would like to understand better. Um, but at the very least, um, this conjecture should also have extensions to higher rank. Um, I only gave you the n equals 2 case here because the triplet algebras are certainly the best understood of all of the Fagan two point algebras. Um, but there should be a natural generalization to higher ranks. Um, again, we have this sort of weird um, sort of modification that ends up being required. We only really analyzed it for n equals two, um, but it seems to be present for any higher n. Um, at the very least, um, what we're able to see is that the computations in the field theory very cleanly reproduce um, computations in the CGP TQFT based on the quantum group. Um, although most of our analysis is sort of at the linear category level, we haven't really gone into the braiding or the tensor structure in the TQFT uh, or the physical TQFT um, because that technology isn't well developed, um, even in simpler cases than the one that we have described here. Um, and it all comes down to the non semi simple um, aspects of these topological twisted TQFTs. Um, but that's something that's sort of in the process of being understood. Um, hopefully, one can extend it all the way to these beasts that we kind of study here. Um, and really um, nail down what all these little uh, subtleties are with tildes and such. Um, okay, great. So that was, I guess I should have asked before, before I, I was given, do I have 50 minutes? You do, but you can take for sure okay. five more. That's cool. Oh, no, that, that was it. Asked Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah, hey, thank I you so wanted much. to make sure if it was an hour, then I didn't want to. No, 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 you're good. Come you're good. in 10 minutes. And 10 for questions is perfect. Thank you so much, okay, Nicholas. Cool. Uh, My pleasure. So, uh, let's thank Nicholas. And uh, if you have a question, I mean yourself, but I have a question, I guess, first. Yeah, of course. So when you were describing this nice triangle of logarithmic Cushionalistic correspondence, yeah. uh, well, you mentioned braided tensor categories. Uh, but then you're also using duals, right? And I do know that Robert McRae and Jingwei Yang, they did prove rigidity 
using some sort of some misimplification argument in the CP1 okay. case of this. Do you expect this categories to all be rigid? Do you expect that to be extremely difficult, I'm guessing, to prove? Um, um, yeah. So the physics also has a um, candidate for a description of the category of line operators. Um, I didn't describe it here just because I didn't want to go too far into the weeds. Um, but the exact definition that one squeezes out of the TQFT is also sort of not um, well understood. There's lots of subtle questions about uh, support of the modules that one finds. Um, very roughly speaking, one ends up finding that the category of modules in this TQFT look like D modules on some horrendously loopy space. Um, and they're equivariant with respect to the gauge symmetries around. And there's actually strong equivariance to some gauge groups and weak equivariance to this churn simons gauge group. Long story short, um, the physics uh, category is not well understood. Um, but that being said, there should be a suitable definition of the physics category that should be dualizable. Um, certainly that's not something that's well understood even in the baby examples um, that don't do this churn simons gauging. Um, and there seem to be meaningful choices one can make. Um, depending on what types of support you allow, you may introduce non-dualizable things. Although there, I, I believe there should be a choice that has dualizability, um, but one has some flexibility here. I really don't know enough about the sort of top row to make an informed statement there um, about whether these things should be dualizable. But the physics suggests that there should be some dualizability here. Um, although that hasn't been studied even in the baby examples. Thank you. Uh, let yeah, me stop the recording before we ask for more questions. I'm sorry, I forgot.